Dr. King, in 1968, he was here. We, he had never seen a black mayor in Atlanta, or Washington, or Montgomery, Birmingham, or Selma. Literally, we've grown exponentially big time. A U.S. Senator from Georgia now. A black and Jew running together as a team was the morning in Georgia. Uh, that's a good thing. But the city has this bound in poverty. So you, you can't just change. Totally must change direction, change, change formulas. So in 68, we fought, rock the right to vote, and now we're using that vote. One more river to cross, you should poverty, working poor people. Most poor people work every day. Unsured, uninsured. That brings up that challenge. We are demanding an emergency program to provide employment for everyone in need of a job. Or if a work program is impractical, a guaranteed annual income at levels that sustain life in decent circumstances. It is now incontestable that the wealth and resources of the United States make the elimination of poverty absolutely practical. CEF, Push Excel, and Rainbow Push Coalition present The Journey Continues as We Mold the Future, a virtual celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Roundtable discussion includes Professor Eddie Glott, Mayor Stephen Reed, and voting rights activist Stacey Abrams. Honorees include Lieutenant Governors Juliana Stratton, Garland Gilchrist, Sheila Oliver, and Mandela Barnes, and viral immunologist Dr. Kizmikia Corbett. Register now, www.rainbowpush.org. There are so many levels of analyses um, that we could use and that we could discuss in terms of what happened on January 6th. And so I'll just start with sedition. I'll start with um, treason. I will start with breaking laws. Um, I will start with criminal behavior. I'll start with terrorism. The terrorists and those who engage in terrorist activities would have to be held accountable for. But I think the greatest thing that happened on January 6th was a, was a significant breach of security of our democracy in the United States of America. It probably since 1812 was the most significant breach. That's the only other time that we saw an attempt to seize the Capitol, the U.S. Capitol. Just think about the ramifications from a domestic standpoint as well as from an international standpoint. For there to be this incitement of terrorist activity by our commander in chief, by the president of the United States is simply inexcusable, inexplicable, and something that has put this country on a path of destruction if we're not very careful to take concrete, decisive steps to turn it around. We saw in living color, if you will, what happened when a group of incited, confused, right-winged terrorists decided to take over the Capitol. Yes. So what we saw as a result were five people were killed. What we saw was 
inadequate law enforcement action, what we saw was evidently complicity from someone within the Capitol, from forces within the Capitol, and evidently complicity within the own administration through the Department of Defense or other um, entities that could have stopped the sedition and the treason and the, and the terrorism that took place. And when we sat, for those of us who are African-American or people of color, black and brown people, we sat in disbelief at the juxtaposition or the disparate treatment between the pretty much peaceful protesters not too long ago from Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. as opposed to these very violent, heavily armed, in some instances, protested that deviated and violated everything that we held sacrosanct in our state's capital. And the lack of response intentionally contrived. This was not something where by accident, there, was not a, there weren't enough law enforcement officers. By accident, we didn't have the military present. By accident, by accident. There was no by accident. This was intentional and it was deliberate. So what we have to see is accountability. We now have to see those who were responsible, whether it was the actual people physically violating the Capitol and breaching the security breaches or those who incited, who incited this catastrophic and terrible terrorist behavior amongst US citizens. So those people must be held accountable, including our commander in chief, including his son, including an officer of the court, Rudy Giuliani, including members of Congress who incited this type of behavior, encouraged it, and, and continued to aid and abet terrorism in the United States. So that's how I see it. And I am looking forward to the accountability. I'm looking forward to seeing those who are, who are responsible being brought to justice, no matter where they sit, no matter where they stand. From that person who was just a confused follower to those who knowingly, from the commander in chief on down, incited these terrible acts of violence and breaches. House Democrats made it official today. The House will be in order. Introducing a resolution urging Vice President Mike Pence to activate the 25th Amendment. To declare President Donald J. Trump incapable of executing the duties of his office. The vote will come tomorrow. And if Vice President Pence does not respond, Democrats move to phase two on Wednesday. We have more than a majority to pass the article of impeachment. California's Ted Lieu co-authored the impeachment resolution, which argues that President Trump gravely endangered the security of the United States last Wednesday. Best way to heal and unify our nation is to hold accountable those who attacked our capital and those who incited that attack. That begins at the very top, starting with Donald Trump. We're gonna walk down to the Capitol. The president's rhetoric, his rhetorical comments, his make America great again, which really meant in his mind and in the minds of others, take America backwards again. Take America back to the period of slavery. Take America back to doing before and after slavery. Take away the rights of individuals who are freedom loving and the rights of individuals who are seeking equal opportunity, equal justice, equal protection under the law. And so we looked up and lo and behold, there we are beleaguered by a mob force trying to break in and establish a coup d'etat on the government of the United States of America. It was not prepared for. Uh, every kind of investigation right now is underway in terms of individuals who had sworn that they would protect the Constitution, who did just the opposite. There are all kinds of complicities underway in terms of individuals who are complicit and who knowingly were a part of the insurrection as opposed to doing their job, which was to protect 
not only the members of Congress, but to protect the Constitution of the United States of America. Because there is no way that this can go without some repercussions. And the repercussions are simply that Americans will not stand by and have all that we have worked for desecrated. The many years that it has taken to get to this point, no, we ain't going back. It's forward ever, backwards never, and we will protect the government and the Constitution of the United States of America. Congressman Davis, in the in the framing, there's a lot of discussion about the timeline. If the House uh, advances the articles of impeachment as we anticipate that there's a thought that there will be little time for an actual trial. Can you explain why the passing of articles of impeachment is so fundamental regardless of what may or may not happen on the Senate side? Because I think a lot of folks don't fully understand the, mecha the mechanism by which the executive is held accountable. Well, I think the position that we are taken in the House and we are fully aware that the timing may be such that there will not be sufficient time for the Senate to conduct a trial before the president's term of office runs out. But a part of the, 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 the purpose is to make sure that Donald Trump is never able to run for office again for a federal office in the United States of America. And so to impeach a, a, a president twice, even though he may not have been convicted by the Senate will still serve a purpose so that we don't have to put up with the next four years of Donald Trump getting ready to run for president again, which will be nothing but a disturbance of, of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the rest of us being able to carry out the people's business and do meaningful work as opposed to having people responding and reacting to the antics of a Donald Trump. In the process of laying out the, the articles, I heard uh, uh, a rather detailed um, explication by Congressman Raskin uh, about what the accusations are. Can you uh, help explain insurrection and sedition, which I think are the two key terms that actually point to why the president's behavior warrants um, impeachment at this time? Well, let me just say that this is going to be my third time of voting to impeach the president. I think that there had already been, Representative Al Green came up with the first one, and I was one of the individuals who voted for Representative Green's resolution to impeach the president, because he had already committed, in my mind, acts that were impeachable. And I didn't need to wait <laughs> until this last fiasco. But the 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 and 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 Representative Raskin has done an outstanding job. He's a constitutional scholar. Uh, he 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 understands fully well what it is that he's doing, and you know he just lost his son, uh, and and of course we all mourn with him, the death of his son. But but insurrection, I, I mean, 
the president, any way you cut it, incited people to attack the seat of the government. I, 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 I mean, Benedict Ong could not have done anything worse than what the president of the United States has done. I, you, you have an attack on your government led by the leader of your government. That's a tough pill to swallow. I, 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 I mean, that's beyond the pale. That's off the chart. And, and so we don't think that the individuals who will be voting will have any difficulty at all explaining to their constituents. As a matter of fact, my constituents are just simply up in arms. My telephone has not stopped ringing. My emails have not stopped coming. People have been dropping off letters at my office, just dropping them off, saying, make it as soon as you can. Impeach. And, and so we think we have every constitutional right. We have everything in order. And we don't think anybody, I mean, every Democrat that I know, and there are some Republicans who are whispering, they're not saying it loud, but they're saying impeach, impeach. So we want him gone too. We just don't want to say it too loudly. But yes, it's everything I think is in order and, and, and we will do it. And we know the strategy and the strategic implications of doing it. Donald Trump is a living, breathing, impeachable offense. If we fail to remove a white supremacist president who incited a white supremacist insurrection, it's communities like Missouri's first district that suffer the most. We have a mandate to legislate in defense of black lives. The first step in that process is to root out white supremacy, starting with impeaching the white supremacist in chief. In Michigan's 13th, we proudly speak truth to power, even in the face of a racist in chief. Those who incited an attack on the People's House do not get to talk about healing and unity. They have torn this country apart. They have stoked the fire and then handed the gasoline to Donald Trump. He needed to say only two words to end the violence. I concede because that's what leaders do in a democracy. My vote to impeach our sitting president is not a fear-based decision. I am not choosing a side, I'm choosing truth. It's the only way to defeat fear. I rise in support of impeaching again, the worst president in the history of the United States. Since his first day in office, this president has spent four years abusing his power, lying, embracing authoritarianism, radicalizing his supporters against democracy. And he is capable of starting a civil war. He must be impeached. He must be stopped now. President Donald J. Trump, our greatest national security threat, must be impeached, held accountable, and never be allowed to hold office again. I've read many of my GOP colleagues know what the president did was wrong, but are afraid for their lives if they cross the president. I'm sorry that you're living in fear, but now is a time to summon your courage. I'm just asking you to do your job and the hold this president accountable. The gentleman's time has expired. There is no excuse for President Trump's actions. That is why with a heavy heart and clear resolve, I will vote yes on these articles of impeachment. In the first impeachment, Republicans said we didn't need to impeach him because he learned his lesson. So no need to remove him. Well, we said if we didn't remove him, he would do it again. Gentlemen's time has expired. Simply put, we told you so. 
I'm the only member of Congress who's been involved in all three of the last presidential impeachments. Those were long proceedings. Today, we don't need a long investigation to know the president incited right-wing terrorists to attack the Congress to try to overturn constitutional government. If we don't impeach to protect our country, we will fail our own oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and, yes, domestic. A week after a pro-Trump mob stormed the Capitol, some calling for the deaths of lawmakers, including Vice President Mike Pence, House members passed an article of impeachment, incitement of insurrection against the president. He must go. He is a clear and present danger to the nation. The House took action after Vice President Mike Pence refused to invoke the 25th Amendment to remove the president from office, saying he would not play political games. The riot happened soon after Pence refused the president's demands to disregard the Electoral College and overturn the election results. We fight like hell, and if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Many lawmakers were furious after the president Tuesday called his pre-riot speech totally appropriate. Over 15,000 National Guard troops have been deployed to Washington to protect lawmakers now through Inauguration Day. We will have no tolerance whatsoever for any attempts to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power on January 20th. The Senate will take the next step in the president's future, holding a vote to possibly convict and bar him from ever holding public office again, likely after he leaves the White House. Outgoing Republican Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, once a loyal Trump ally, has reportedly said he's in favor of impeachment, a sign a Senate conviction could happen. As delighted as all of the people that I know were when the two senators from Georgia <laughs> got elected. You're talking about dancing in the streets. You, 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 you're talking about a joyous time. But what will have happened? You know, it, it's a high bar to get two thirds of the members of the Senate to vote to oust a president. I mean, that that's a high bar. And if we ever reach that level of unification and that level of, 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 of agreement, then there would just be no question at all. There would be no opportunity to go and talk about how divided our country is. It would mean a coming together of our country to realize that the problems we face, the COVID-19, the pandemic, the unemployment, the lack of jobs, lack of opportunity, the people who are hungry, who are being set out of their apartment, who can't pay the rent, who can't pay the mortgage, that those issues are so important that we have to come and we will have reasoned together. And so it would just be great to see that happen, although I don't expect it to happen this quickly, but we're on our way. Democrats now will be in control of the United States Senate, and we're going to be able to pass some unbelievable legislation that's going to be helpful to the country because the Senate will be catching up to the House of Representatives. At 79 years old, suffering from Parkinson's disease, Reverend Jesse Jackson is considered a priority patient to receive the COVID-19 vaccine. But many in the healthcare community are also hoping the image of Jackson receiving the shot will help encourage more people in black and brown communities to follow his lead. Vaccination. Vaccination. Now. now. Keep hope. Keep hope. Alive. It's absolutely symbolically 
massively important so we can show one of the greatest African-American leaders in history that he's willing to get the vaccine and he wants to inspire his people to come out and get the vaccine as well. Dr. Kazmika Corbett is a government scientist who was instrumental in the development of the Moderna vaccine. Hesitancy comes with misinformation, but also lack of information because many times there have not been anyone like myself who has been able to break down the scientific information to communities like this. It's hoping to work. So it's hard to happen so fast. Well, it wasn't just walk speed. She's been working on Corona six years. It didn't start last March. It's, it's a conclusion of a, of a, of a spot of work. So uh, we find COVID-19 and COVID-19 too. The racial factor is real to us. Having said that, we must not think this is aimed at us because it's a global pandemic. With all of those things bridging together, I think that hopefully as time progresses, and I know we're not going to get over the hump of vaccine hesitancy in this one instance, but hopefully as time progresses, we can start to rebuild some of that trust and start to really open those lines of communications um, from the scientific perspective back to the communities um, so that we can get the ball rolling and start to save lives for COVID and, and for other diseases with that being said. Good morning. We are in the midst of a major drive to get more members, more people engaged and involved in Rainbow Push, uh, supporting the programs of Push for Excellence and the Citizenship Education Fund. If you're interested in public policy and you want to help change the policies that impact those incarcerated, change the policies that impact uh, students attending uh, colleges and universities, if you want to be a policymaker, then you need to join Rainbow Push and join by paying your $35 right now. Some of you watch us every week. You, you listen to us on the radio. You're viewing us on social media. We need you to become a member. It's only $35 a year. If you believe in the scholarships that we give to thousands of students each and every year, we've awarded more than $10 million to scholars year to date. What do you have to do to give and support PUSH? It's really very simple. You can go to rainbowpush.org if you're on a computer and press donate. Give any amount, every dollar is important. If you want to talk to somebody, call us at 773-256-2775. You can give right now, any denomination that you uh, choose. You can text the word PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444. Text the word on your cell phone. Most of you have a cell phone. Just text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444, and you can give any amount that you feel comfortable giving or call us 773-256-2775 or go to rainbowpush.org and just press donate. Wherever you are, you can support us as we keep pushing for you. Police are squabbling with protesters. Oh, there we go. In light of January 6th, but before you get to January 6th, the entire year of 2020, where are we now? January. <laughs> 16th, the day after Dr. King's actual birthday, January 15, 2021. And so when I asked that question, let's look at where we were in 2020 that frames where we are today, Dr. Year. Well, where we are in 2020 is really kind of established by taking a look back, uh, even as we were kind of having the early discussion about 
what we would talk about today, if we think about the significance of January, not just Dr. King's birth month, January 6th in terms of a new historical marker that's been kind of etched in the hearts, the minds, and now the history books of the nation and the world. January for Black folk has always been a critical time because it, it is the day, New Year's Day, as we just talked about a couple of weeks ago, an Emancipation Day. This notion of liberty and freedom is, is so much part and parcel about how we identify the new year that what we've seen over the last several days is beyond an affront and an assault to what that freedom actually means. It's a reminder that since the Emancipation Proclamation that took effect New Year's Day in 1863, since the end of the Civil War, since the ratification of the Civil War Amendments, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, 13th Amendment gets rid of slavery, supposedly, with the caveat of punishment for crime, 14th Amendment gives us due process and equal protection to the states, not just under the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution for the federal government. 15th Amendment is about birthright citizenship, something that gives us a different legal status in the law and in the Constitution. And so when we think about where we are, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, and Pastor Sharp, I've been wrestling with this, it's, it's where we thought we were ain't where we are. And so I think we have to kind of reset our GPS is off. We, we've lost connection with the satellite that gave us a sense that uh, since the days of the election of a Barack Obama, this notion of post-racialism, not only are we not post-racial, we are back in the dark ages of kind of the, the kinder, gentler, but now more hostile, more overt white supremacist racism that's showing up just kind of in the streets. They had nothing that, that hindered them from being just blatant. Everything from we taking selfies to videoing what we're doing because at the end of the day, uh, while we may have taken down the statutes of Roger Brooks uh, Tawney, uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice who gave us the Dred Scott decision, we may have taken down the symbols, we've not dismantled the substance of the notion mm -hmm. that this is still a country where black people have no substantive rights that white people are bound to respect. So that's what takes me, uh, uh, Reverend Sharp, to Dr. King's Where Do We Go From Here book, because he opens the book with that just that kind of discussion and reminder. He, he starts talking about Lyndon Johnson signing the Voting Rights Act of 1965. That was after people were murdered, as you remember. You've read and we've all read about Bloody Sunday. So then, you know, president signs the bill so we can now vote. But every, he says, every time we've made progress, there's been this immediate backlash mm -hmm. to take us back to where we once were. So you're a student uh, from graduate of Morehouse, uh, Dr. King's place, Gardner Taylor, I mean, I say? freelanced at Morehouse. Come on, <laughs> I freelanced at Morehouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say this: uh, one but of the most, the yeah, one of the most riveting things I heard January six and the days after was that so many commentators and so many politicians were saying, "This is not us. This is not who we are." And I'm sitting there saying, "This is who we are." What we saw displayed the insurrection, the anarchy, the sedition, the just blatant show of white privilege and white supremacy, that is exactly who America is. And the people from the margins have been trying to yell as loud as they can to say, listen, this is bigotry at its best. This is unjust. This is inequitable treatment of people in this country and nobody has heard us. And so it's unfortunate that somehow God I believe in the divine power of God used Wednesday to show everybody from every corner in every continent in every city just what the people on the margins have been saying. Nothing is going to change until we have conversations and deal with the original sin in this country, which is racism, 
and the, and, and the child of racism that has been birthed is capitalism. So when you talk about the economic movement saying, hey, there's redlining issues, there's educational disenfranchisement, there's voter suppression still going on. They're talking about voter fraud. Black folk been dealing with voter suppression and voter fraud <laughs> since, since we've been in this country. And so I just think that finally the hypocrisy and the inconsistency is on display and it might be the best blessing. I told someone last week was the worst, best week we've had in four years in this country. It was the worst, best week because no longer can you say, ah, no, y'all are just saying that you're pulling your black card. If it had been black people at that Capitol, we would have had our second, not bloody Sunday, but it would have been a bloody Wednesday. What have we gained and what must we we seek to gain because some people who are working in reasonably comfortable positions, even some who are in government, are now shocked at what happened on the 6th, while the masses are not shocked, shocked at all. They, they just, the uh, only thing they said was, if, as you said, if it were not for the fact that they were white, they would have murdered us, they would have tear gassed us, they would have arrested masses of people. How do you walk in the Capitol? And Dr. Yeri, you've been in and out of that Capitol building a number of times, but you had to go through screening and, and all sorts of things just to get inside the building. People showed a, a, a police badge and were able to walk through or just walk through. I think that we have to really look at what have we gained and where are we in terms of our rights. Dr. King says, we got them to treat us more decently, but we've not gotten equity. We have, we've not received, we've not achieved equality. We have the freedom to go in and out of stores and buy stuff. We have the freedom to eat in restaurants, but we're not equal to own the restaurant, buy the restaurant, supply the restaurant, and be the, the CEO of a chain. We don't have that level of equity, but yeah, we can go eat and spend as much money as we can muster up. Hmm. So what do you see as we look at where we were and where we are today? You know, when you look at where we were and where we are today, I feel like, and I love Dr. King, I'm a student of Dr. King, but uh, it's been said before and I wanna add on my voice to the choir, segregation, uh, integration set us back in some ways. It gave the illusion of achievement you know, mm -hmm. now we can sit at the table. <laughs> and you know, the best story I heard about this to kind of show where we are, I think it was either Pastor Charles Gilchrist Adams or Reverend Gardner Taylor, but somebody told the story about a dog that used to chase them on the way to school. Mm -hmm. And the dog would chase them and bite him. And finally the, the, the boy, young man's father had enough and made the people build a fence but the day after the fence was built, the boy walked by and the dog still snarled at him. He went as far as he could to the fence, still trying to bite him. And he said, so the fence didn't change that dog's heart. It just kept him from biting me. I feel like we have a bunch of fences up right now in 2021. I don't know what we're going to have to do to change the hearts of people. At this point, a couple of things we need to do. We need to have a conversation around cult mentality, C-O-L-T, cult mentality. Uh, we need to have conversations around the fact that the American empire is collapsing. It's not about to collapse. We are watching it collapse. And usually every major empire throughout history collapse from the inside. It's an implosion rather than someone on the outside. So we need to have conversations around cult mentality because that's what MAGA is. It's a cult. And until you understand that, you will not understand how they're thinking or moving. We are in the middle of an American uh, empire collapse. So we need to talk about that. And number three, we need to have conversations, not arguments, not debates. We need to understand what they're saying because when I tell you as smart as I think I am, I do not understand what some of Trump supporters are even thinking. It is so illogical. And then I'd speak and they think I'm illogical. So at this point, we need to seek understanding. What are you take your country back from what? What at this point, help me because I'm feeling like I'm in kindergarten and I don't know if I'm smarter than a fifth grader. <laughs> well, 
you you you're you're a whole lot smarter than a fifth grader, and, and much smarter than I was back, back back in the day when I was hanging out uh, in, in on that red clay hill. Here here's where I think we invoke the wisdom of those who have joined the ancestors, and among them is Dr. Francis Cress Wilson. When she wrote the ISIS papers and framed the notion of racism from the perspective of white people, it is the fear of genetic annihilation. So here, what has this president been pushing back on? Immigration, we can't have black and brown people from SO countries coming across the border, having babies here that then get citizenship birthright under the 15th amendment. We've got to change the dynamic. We got to build a wall. We've got to create obstacles. And at the same time, we've got to stoke the fear, uh, purebred, if you will, white folk, because we tired of seeing the Cheerios commercials with the mixed the couple and the mixed babies, because we, we ain't sure how that works out when we come uh, comes down to racial classification and the census allows for multiracial identity for about everything except white. White is still white. And so when your political identity, when your economic well-being and your sense of individual safety in terms of your own ego needs are put at risk, there's this, there's this fear. And I think it's that fear that we saw stoked at the Capitol. And we hear that it's coming again uh, in the next few days, right? There, there's, there are gonna be repeats of this. We saw it in Michigan. We heard it with the attempts to, uh, to kidnap, right? And, and maybe even torture uh, governors, executives of states. And so when we hear all of this, there's something about white racial paranoia that has now reached a bottleneck and it is now so uncontrollable becomes, because it comes with the sanction of the endorsement of a president and, and the complicity of an entire group of people that would rather talk about an election being stolen. Now, mind you, it's white people telling other white people, white Republican, other white Republicans telling white Republicans it was not stolen, and yet, what we've seen perpetrated is this stoking of racial fear, the threat, there's the threat of black violence, and then there's a threat of black power. And the black power at the ballot box has scared and shaken the foundation of the democracy at its core. And there is a backlash and it is a white lash. Don't, don't get it twisted. And it is, uh, to your point, uh, Reverend Sharp, this, this notion of the empire imploding, my fear is, is that when it implodes from the inside, are we gonna be the ones that they have to come find in the rubble? And if we don't have a, a response that not only liberates ourselves, Paulo Freire says in Pedagogy of the Oppressed, is that you cannot have the oppressed go free if you don't free the oppressor at the same time. And so it has to your point to be a comprehensive liberation discussion. Otherwise we're continuing to have these circular uh, uh, conversations where we're talking past each other and not getting to the substance of what everybody and ultimately so wants, think, which is the affirmation of human dignity. Yes, sir. I think as we talk about having these con genuine conversations, we really have to look at, uh, you sent me a book that really kind of helped to frame some of this and I've been reading cast by Isabel Wilkerson. We have to deal with the whole idea that this was a move by a group of people led by someone who had decided to eliminate this dem democratic way of existing as a nation and creating a Nazi regime, a place where one person are surrounded by a military group would control all of the educational, the economic, the, every, all of the health care, control of people so much so that they, they dictated their comings and goings. And then there was this notion of a superior race, which you know takes us back to the fear of the rise of black, brown, and yellow people in this country. As, as they looked at the predictions of the census, we are going to be the majority in America. And so there is this fear that somehow we will do to them what they've done to the Native Americans, what they did to African Americans. And I guess we have to really, when we talk about the conversation, it has to be talking about how do you get people to understand the power has been isolated 
among a few people, even those that marched into the Capitol don't realize that the power was only in the hands of a few bad men. It did not make them better. They used them as pawns like you play chess. Meanwhile, the king is being surrounded. He disappears. He's like, Elvis, I'm here and I'm gone. I'll be with you on the street in the next minute. He's, he disappears, hides for days, and they're out there uh, breaking into the, the capital, tearing down the symbols of, of the nation for all the world to see. I want to jump in right here, Dr. Wilson, if it's okay. Um, Please jump. One, one, one of the things that we cannot be reduced to and, and as much as we want to do it, it breaks my heart when I see people generalize. To me, Dr. Yeary, you might agree, when you hear people overgeneralize, make hasty, broad generalizations, it is a sign of a lack of intelligence because you cannot group all Black people. We're not monolithic. All Black people are not this way. All white people are not this way. We need to help our people and their people understand, stop with the generalizations stop stereotyping each other. Our enemy is not white people. Our enemy is white privilege. For a woman, the enemy is not man. The enemy is male privilege. So we have to, we have to make sure that we are fighting concepts and stop fighting each other. And as principalities. Yeah, come on now, it's, something, it's a concept, it's we a theory. Yeah, it's a, it's a mindset, it's a theoretical approach, it's an ideological construction. We're fighting that, we have got to stop fighting each other. And I think that that's what Dr. King was trying to say. Dr. King's argument was, you know, he's saying nonviolence. Well, black folk weren't violent, why are you telling us this, Doc? We, we, we weren't <laughs> lynching people. He, what, he said, no, 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 it's the consciousness. You, we got to shift their consciousness. We got to help them understand that what they're doing is inhumane. We become more peaceful and they realize, why are we fighting people who aren't fighting back? How are you going to play tag with somebody that won't call it? How are you going to throw a ball with somebody that won't play catch? He was like, shift the mindset. And it didn't work in some ways. And it did work in some ways. But the art of the more, what is it? Well, come on with the quote. You, 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 you were there. Come Keep on. Going. The art of the more Preach, universe. Right. universe is long. Is long but it bends towards justice. So we have got to hold on. I was telling my church this, we've got to hold on to our hope. I mean, it's the simple stuff that a brighter day is possible, but it will not happen without conversations. It will not happen without understanding and these stereotypes, we cannot participate in their game because we will keep perpetuating the same evil. There's an important piece there. I'm, I'm glad you raised the issue of generalizations because when we talk about whiteness, Whiteness, come uh, on. Sh Cheryl Harris, a law professor in California, wrote a brilliant piece, almost 25 years old now. Mm. It's called Whiteness is Property. That whiteness after the Plessy decision was cast as a property right mm. to, the, to, the, to the notion of, of it being an idea, a concept. And so property rights are not evenly distributed. It depends on what your, what your status is in relationship to the right. So if, if I'm the land owner, I have a certain level of rights. If I am a tenant, I have a certain level of rights. If I am a trespasser, I have a, no rights. And if, if I'm an invitee, I have only rights that go as far as the economic benefit to the one who owns the land. Now I'm going somewhere with this. Because when we think about this notion of whiteness, whiteness started as a privilege related to land ownership. That's who could vote at the time of the constitution. That's who had the status, the known status as citizen. And then it began to kind of evolve, right? Because in the evolution and the expansion of the plantation marketplace, they didn't like the idea, the, 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 the landowners didn't like the idea that they were outnumbered. They had to create a framework that would allow them to maintain the power interest without having to change the numbers, right? Because they didn't want more landowners. They wanted to have the exclusivity of land ownership, but to have those who did not have that status to reinforce their places of privilege. And so here's what we've got. All white people don't get invited 
to the white people meeting. And when I'm talking about the white people meeting, I'm talking about the 1% who control 40% of the wealth to the exclusion of a whole bunch of other folks. And, and then in this process, we find ourselves kind of fighting over the crumbs that are falling from the master's table mm -hmm. because we've not yet found economic parity and justice amongst one of the three great evils that Dr. King talked about, racism, poverty, and war. Yeah. And so when, we, when we're wrestling with these issues, part of the solidarity, uh, Pastor Sharp, that I think you're pointing to is we got to recognize that the vast majority of the folks, black, white, blue, green, whatever Reverend says, red, black, brown, yellow, white. What does he say, uh, Rev Reverend Dr. Wilson? Uh, I, I, we'll, get it, we'll get it later. Uh, we're all precious all in God's precious sight. God's sight. Well, we all precious in God's sight, but we're not all precious in government sight. And until we get back to this place to be able uh, to make sure that everybody has a place in the conversation and until everybody gets included, nobody's included, right? The, the direct, indirect <clears throat> statement that Dr. King makes, I think it is one that is so profound that uh, we've got to wrestle with what are the essential concerns of being human mm -hmm. and not classified by a category that allows the government to divide and conquer. How do you, as both of you are profound preachers, theologians, and have this prophetic calling on your lives, how do you see us moving our people and the nation towards Dr. King's beloved community in light of all that you said, all that we know, and all that is yet to come? I'm gonna let Sharp close. I'm gonna be the setup right here. Um, cause, cause, cause I, I, know, I know he can bring it. Uh, Dr. King- He is able. <laughs> I'd look, won't, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Dr. King was not just a public figure. He was a preacher. Something different happens when the moral voice and framing of one called by God enters the room. That's why the church has been so fundamentally essential to not just our, our survival, but, but our ascension as a people in this country, not, not because you know, we get into the arguments about where, where did the, uh, the conversation about the religion begin, but how we used it, how it was implemented to advance the conversation. Raphael Warnock, Senator-elect, is a preacher. Now Senator Warnock is a preacher. He is carrying the prophetic mantle of the word and power of God to the upper chamber of the United States government that was under assault. Uh, Pastor Reginald Sharp is a preacher. Oh yes, he is, don't get it twisted. And so he frames the new reality, balancing what's going on in the newspaper with what's going on in the book so that when folks take a walk down the text of the scripture, they see that when we then go to the close and we, we invoke the words, be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you, that it is not just for poetic inspiration, it is actually the grounding of our hope and we hold on to it for dear life until times get better. Man, that's so rich. And I think that we got to close, so I'll just do the invitation to discipleship. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say this. I, I agree 120 percent with Dr. Yeary. I said this in the middle of the movement last summer. Everybody was wondering, what do we do? George Floyd has been murdered, even assassinated. You know, you can use whatever word you want to use. Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, in the heart and the thick of it, people were asking me, what do we do? And I remembered when I was serving a church in Macon, Georgia, and I, I, I held a prayer visual. And there were preachers who I found out later refused to come because they said, what good is a prayer visual? Mm -hmm. And I said to the, my response was, sometimes you can drop a pebble in a lake and it might just create a ripple, but that ripple later on might become a wave and that wave can reshape landscapes. Because it's so overwhelming, to think about what do we do? I'm, I'm a student, I'm a pastor, I'm an essential worker, I'm a nurse, I'm a bus driver, I'm a grandparent, what do I do? Everybody get your pebble and go make some movement. Let the artists do their artistry. 
Let the singers write new music. Let the preachers be prophetic. Let the teachers educate their children with the black, uh, with the black uh, mindset or, or landscape of showing them reality from the black person's perspective. Let everybody do what they can do. And who knows, God may take that pebble, turn it into a ripple that becomes a wave that can transform landscapes. He did it with Fannie Lou Hamer and we're still talking about it. He did it with Septima Poinsett Clark and we're still talking about it. He did it with Ella Baker and we're still talking about her. He did it with Malcolm and Marcus and Martin and we're still talking about them. So stop feeling like you got to save the whole world and just get your cross and walk up your hill and be willing to sacrifice some blood for somebody else. CEF, Push Excel, and Rainbow Push Coalition present The Journey Continues as We Mold the Future, a virtual celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Roundtable discussion includes Professor Eddie Glott, Mayor Stephen Reed, and voting rights activist Stacey Abrams. Honorees include Lieutenant Governors Juliana Stratton, Garland Gilchrist, Sheila Oliver, and Mandela Barnes, and viral immunologist Dr. Kizmikia Corbett. Register now, www.rainbowpush.org. Dr. King, I went to jail with a group of seven students July 17th, 1960, almost 60 years ago. We never stopped moving. I lost a few jail cells and death. We never stopped moving. I thought it was time to write some of it down so the only community range can learn how we did, what we did, and how global it was. We were speaking about Mandela in South Africa, uh, India, Qatar, about Gandhi in India, uh, here at home. This book tells the story, so please get it and give it to your friends. Read it, let's, let's argue about it, let's discuss it. Yep, so the book is Keeping Hope Alive, Sermons and Speeches of Reverend Jesse Jackson um, Sr. It's, it's quite a good collection. You know, we've got sermons and speeches from around the globe because you have made such a global impact, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. Thank you for tuning in to our International Saturday Morning Broadcast. We need your support. Here are ways to give to Rainbow Push Coalition. Text PUSH, P-U-S-H, to 41444 to support the work of Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr. and Rainbow Push Coalition. When you shop Amazon Gives, visit Amazon Smile and select PUSH for Excellence as your charitable organization by starting your shopping at Smile. Dot Amazon dot com. Hi, I'm Todd Yeary here outside Dr. King's workshop, the Rainbow Push headquarters, where people of goodwill from all walks and all places gather as comrades in the movement for justice and equality. Social justice movements have been birthed in the imaginations of people in places just like this. You can be a part of this justice movement too. Join Rainbow Push as we fight for justice in the 21st century. Go to rainbowpush.org or dial 773 Freedom and remember, keep hope alive. Get involved with the movement. Join the movement. If you're not a member, become a member. I am somebody. Fighting the most important battles for freedom and justice for all. You made us change. Oh, try to bring closer. Join Rainbow Push. But you're not pushing me away. Join the movement. Join Rainbow Push.